Gentlemen, may I bid you all welcome here and say one word before I start speaking. Uh, I am starting speaking. And that is the uh, translation. Button number two is French and number three is English. You may wonder why I have asked you to come here. I have in mind a completely frank and open exchange of views and this is ensured to you and it is essential for our success. There is no verbatim quotation of anybody and there is no press so you are quite free to let yourselves go if I miss it. My name is Daniel Ostulin. I'm an investigative journalist. I spent 12 years beginning in the mid-1990s until about the year 2002-2003 in military counterintelligence. Then I got burnt out and normal. It's uh, what basically happens to all of us. We all uh, burnt out. I realized that I had a lot of information that I've accumulated over the years and I thought it would be a good way of getting some of this information out and uh, one of the subjects that I thought would be of interest to the general population would be this very secretive, not secret, but secretive organization calling themselves the Bilderberg Group. Even before I joined the, uh, the service uh, in 1992, I'm in Toronto in a Spanish restaurant called uh, Segovia with a friend of mine uh, who was uh, um, in the service in the KGB. And uh, over steak and potato lunch, this man, let's just call him Vladimir. And uh, according to him, Canada was gonna be split up into English and French speaking Canada. Uh, through a referendum which was going to be put together from behind the scenes by these allegedly very powerful people. Now the reason he said that this was going to happen is that the powerful people who ran the United States needed to balance their budget. 1995 comes around, that's three years into the future, and suddenly all these characters, all these people, all these politicians that I've never heard of begin to appear front and center in front of television, you know, screens. And all the things that this man told me about three years earlier, in 1995, were front and center. And then I suddenly realized that if the presidents and the prime ministers were powerless about the body politic itself, about moving the events forward into a certain direction. If they were just bit actors playing their part, then my question is, who the hell runs the world? Imagine a private club where presidents, prime ministers, international bankers and generals rub shoulders and where the people running the wars, the markets and governments say what they never say in public. It 
es un momento que estamos en los inicios de la Guerra Fría. Es una guerra que no sabe cuánto va a durar, le durará pues, hasta 1989. Pero en 1954 eso está todavía muy crudo, muy incierto y en una fase inicial. Entonces, han empezado a rodar ya las Naciones Unidas y se vislumbra la necesidad defensiva de la OTAN. Luego, por otra parte, en Europa las monarquías europeas sienten endogámicamente esa necesidad de defender sus propios intereses, intereses de estatus social, intereses económicos y también intereses de defensa hacia el exterior. Entonces, Estados Unidos asume esa postura común, pero tomando la dirección. Well, the real reason for, for the uh, interference of uh, the CIA with Bilderberg was actually the Cold War that was coming up at that time, and they tried to, to use all the institutes they could get to, uh, well, to steer the public opinion in, the, well, in, in Europe, and actually also in the rest of the world where they had influence, and Bilderberg was, uh, was one of them, and that was the reason that they financed the Bilderberg, the first meeting. Not totally, but for a, for a great part, anyway. What today is called the Bilderberg Group, you could take it way, way, way back to about, you know, the period just after the Fourth Crusade, 1200, 1204. And what today is called the Bilderberg Group, or Bilderberg Society, back then already existed, and it was called the Venetian Black Nobility. You know, they're absolutely a continuation of Venice, because basically you had a migration of the Venetian system of oligarchical power over Europe into the Low Countries, in fact, into the Netherlands where Bilderberg was really founded. And it's an absolute continuity of the Venetian system of power. And in fact, if you do some tracing of some of the family lineages, you'll find in many instances, the Torn and Toxis family, for example, migrated from Venice into Northern Europe and still remain a mainstay of the Bilderberg oligarchical structures. You have a Bilderberg meeting taking place once a year, beginning in 1954. The first meeting took place at the Bilderberg Hotel in the Netherlands. And the host of that conference was Prince Bernhardt, the Dutch royal consort, who was a card-carrying member of the Nazi apparatus during uh, the Second World War period. The people who actually come to Bilderberg meetings, they're the people who can move forward with the agenda of these societies. So you have President of the International Monetary Fund, President of the World Bank, President of the European Central Bank, of the Federal Reserve Board. You have key presidents and prime ministers and all these individuals on the political level, also on the empresarial level, and also in the media. And they all work together with people in the military. They all work together with the representatives of the banking cartels. And again, if you're a corporation, you don't need to control every person in the company. You just need to control one person who controls the policy of the entire corporation. You can say the same thing about countries. You don't need to control the entire country. You just need to control enough key decision makers, be it president, be it prime minister, be it key senators and congressmen, people in the Federal Reserve, people in the European Central Bank, the people in the European Commission. You control them, and through them you control the rest. Every year Bilderberg has a gathering. They'll bring together one to 200 people, many of whom make up the core of the transatlantic financial and political oligarchy. And they'll bring together uh, a core group of powerful individuals, government people, the media, finance, and prospective young recruits, people in the political realm who are up and coming and who are going to be seduced and controlled by these oligarchical interests. And very often, these meetings serve as a kind of a testing ground for whether or not certain people will be advanced in their political careers, including a number of individuals who've been elected president of the United States have been put through this kind of Bilderberg finishing school process. They 
The Bilderberg Conference comprises uh, about 130 of the world's or Western world's top decision makers from the banks, the multinational companies, the EU Commission. Uh, I'm coming to the politicians, also from WTO, IMF, World Bank, and of course leading politicians uh, from the US, Canada, uh, Eurozone, and the UK. Uh, and I think. Though they were clearly discussing some of the biggest issues uh, confronting uh, the Western economies at this time, why have we had no statement, either from the Prime Minister or from the Chancellor or indeed from the uh, Minister without portfolio, all of whom intended in an official capacity, why did they offer no statement, even though such decisions may well have a significant effect? on UK government policy or the livelihood of uh, future UK citizens. In May 1973, Bilderberg Group met at an exclusive resort at Salstobaden, Sweden. The key point on the Bilderberg meeting agenda was the oil shock of 1973 the 400% targeted increase in the price of OPEC oil in the near future. The oil shock, the hoax, it was in fact the hoax of 1973, continuing into the late 1970s. And the whole point of the oil shock was to create a nominal flow of money into the hands of the Saudis and other uh, Persian Gulf wealthy nations. The oil hoax ultimately created an enormous volume of wealth transfer nominally into the OPEC countries, the so-called petrodollars, but all of that money went right to London and Wall Street to be managed. So the financial oligarchy in its major centers used the oil hoax to establish an absolute domination over world credit to make sure that it no longer went for any development. You have the charisma of a damp rag and the appearance of a low-grade bank clerk. And the question that I want to ask, the question that I want to ask, that we're all going to ask, is who are you? I'd never heard of you. Nobody in Europe had ever heard of you. I would like to ask you, President, who voted for you? And what mechanism? Oh, I know democracy is not popular with you lot. And uh, what mechanism Mr. do President, the peoples of Europe have Mr. to remove President. you? Is this European democracy? Well, I've tried very hard not to believe in conspiracy theories, but I've been here now uh, for over 15 years, and I can see there is a move towards supranationalism. Just look at the IMF. In Washington, supposed to be independent, effectively, it's become a branch office of the European Commission, uh, and I've got to know over the years the Van Rompuys, the Schultzes, uh, you know, the Barrosos, even the Junkers, the Timmermans, um, and it's completely clear they actually want to destroy the nation state as a unit. Uh, they, a few years ago, the Greek Prime Minister said, I'll give you a referendum. He was removed and replaced by a former Goldman Sachs director. And whenever the project goes wrong, whether it's the Euro has a crisis or the asylum crisis with the borders, every single time there is for these guys an opportunity. It's known as the beneficial crisis.
The very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. We decided long ago that the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment of pertinent facts far outweighed the dangers which are cited to justify it, the facts they deserve to know. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. As in a television soap opera, there are actually secret spin-off organizations similar to the Bilderberg Group who play a vital role in the New World Order scheme to use wealth concentrated in the hands of a few to exert world control. In 1968, uh, George Ball uh, and the Bilderbergers met and uh, determined that they had to restructure the entire world along the lines of a corporation. They decided that the idea of the nation state was outmoded, it was archaic, it was standing in their way, and that therefore they wanted to have what they called a world company based upon the idea of a corporate uh, identity. Don't just talk about it, be about it, hungry for the money as soon as I see a dollar money green in my collar. Fresh like that, yeah, write the checks, put the checks right back, yeah. straight to the account. Your honey wanna holler, only thing to separate me from my money is a comma. Big bills, big papers, it gets real. Big haters, what it be, understand how I said it made. Well, what this is actually is part of what's called globalization. You had in the 60s and then continuing in an expanding form in the 70s and 80s a, a rash of mergers which uh, corporations merged, uh, agricultural corporations merged, the financial institutions merged, uh, and you, you had a general takeover of the world economy by these huge mega firms. Uh, the corporate uh, banking mergers tended to control the corporate industrial mergers and the agricultural mergers, so you had basically a world run by this financial uh, these massive agri uh, financial institutions. The concept is one world company limited. Corporations that have a hell of a lot more power than any government on the planet. And you're seeing it right now that governments don't govern, presidents don't do anything other than do what people who put them in power tell them to do. And so the idea is that all of these corporations, the Goldman Sachs of this world, the JP Morgans, etc., they are the key people in all key institutions around the world. And it's through them that the power base is exercised. So again, it's not one world government, it's one world company, limited corporations with a lot more power than any government on the planet. And in fact, this was discussed at the Bilderberg Conference in 1968, where George Ball, under Secretary for Economic Affairs with JFK and Johnson, he said, and I quote, loosely quote, how can we create corporations that can actually give orders to governments? And this is what you have today. E mentre qui ci vengono presentate delle soluzioni, una decina di giorni fa, nel chiuso e nel segreto delle riunioni del club Bilderberg, molti esponenti della dell'alta burocrazia e delle leadership politiche eh, europee eh, si sono riuniti probabilmente per dare le direttive 
alle direttive che poi verranno presentate al Parlamento europeo. Eh, che non potrà fare altro che esaminarle. Anche ho sentito questa mattina il, eh, eh, il Presidente Barroso l'invito a portare aiuto agli amici greci, non vorrei che l'aiuto fosse soprattutto al suo amico armatore Spiro Lazzi, c'è un evidente conflitto di interessi per il signor Barroso e dovrebbe darne spiegazione. L'Europa oggi è sotto il dominio dei poteri forti e purtroppo anche dei poteri occulti. L'Unione Europea con l'Euro e la Banca Centrale Europea ha espropriato i nostri popoli di un bene prezioso, la sovranità monetaria. Non siamo più padroni della nostra moneta e quindi del nostro futuro. E questo è molto grave perché noi crediamo invece nell'Europa dei popoli e delle regioni, quindi della libertà. Poteri occulti che si nascondono dietro figure di personaggi che vengono imposti con le loro decisioni sulla pelle dei popoli e sulla testa dei nostri popoli. E sono sempre banchieri. It is about the building of an empire and the paradox of this project, of this supranational European project, is the least popular it becomes with the people, the bigger mess it creates, the more power they get at the center. Well, with the Lisbon Treaty, European nations have lost almost their entire sovereignty. And we are now back to a pre-nation state condition, meaning feudalism. You know, we're living on a very small planet with limited natural resources and never growing population base. If you extrapolate that into the near future, in one generation we're going to go to about 10 billion people, then we're going to go to 14, 18, 21. It's going to get to the point, we're always going to have enough space, because 7 billion people, space-wise, is not a lot. But we are running out of food, and we are running out of water, and we're running out of natural resources. So for the elitists, for the Rockefellers of this world to survive, and I say Rockefeller not because he's important, but because he's well known, he's popular, which is not the same as being important. For the Rockefellers of this world to survive, most of us have to die. was an absolutely willful act on the part of precisely this Bilderberg apparatus. not really the idea of capitalism because in, in the end with these people have or are, they already control 90% of the planet. Every aspect of society, everything you eat, everything you look at, everything you touch, mostly is in the private hands of these billionaires today. But the idea is again, the, the, you know, the whole idea of deindustrializing the world, it's a gradual process. You can do it, you know, via armed conflict, but it's costly and it's also dangerous because you can take everything off the chessboard, them and you at the same time. But the point is, if you can do it gradually, start dismantling, you know, the different service industries, the different sectors of society, before long you have a Detroit and before long you have a Greece, before long you have Spain, which is, you know, 70% population or, or, or uh, unemployment for kids under 30. And this is reality, and this is how it's done. It's a gradual process of deindustrialization, demand destruction, 
and zero growth. And if you talk about zero growth, the whole concept itself came out of the 1972 study put together by the Club of Rome. The role of the Club of Rome back in the 1970s was to try to popularize the big lie that man could not continue to develop because resources were supposedly limited. And they used a ridiculous modernized version of the old argument of Malthus and Aristotle to simply state that based on mathematical equations, we would exhaust the resources. Fast forward 40 years and look what we have today. We have a Detroit. And another 40 years into the future, we have the entire world which is gonna look like Detroit and Detroit is gonna look like paradise. Well, yes, there was another reason, and that is that the bailout was a scam, a fraud. It was uh, under the guise of saving banking institutions, which they saved temporarily. They were effectively taking unpayable debt, huge quantities of unpayable debt, and transferring it from private corporations to governments. Uh, this didn't make the debt any more payable. They basically absorbed huge quantities of worthless paper, speculative derivative paper, which could not be paid off in any period of time anyway, i.e. the governments became bankrupt. Now you see this in Europe uh, over the last years where each country is being forced to do the same thing that was done in the U.S., take on the, the massive debts of these banks and effectively leaving them bankrupt. What you have is the growth of corporate dictatorships under the banking institutions that run the governments, corporate fascism. And in fact, you see the world increasingly coming under the control of corporate fascist uh, governments under the control of the banking institutions. You know, if you kind of go back in history, 6,000 years or so, and you look at who controlled society 6,000 years ago in ancient Egypt, this weren't the pharaohs, though the, 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 the high priests who basically gave us knowledge one little droplet at a time, just enough knowledge for us to survive and get by as we do today, just enough for us to get by day to day to day to day with what meager salaries we earn. Now, so on the one hand, what you had back then, you had the high priests giving us this, you know, droplets of knowledge. But on the other hand, in the last 6,000 years, especially now, with technological revolution, with information revolution, information technology. People have computers and have access to internet and suddenly all this information which for thousands of years, which was only available to secret societies and very private organizations who passed it on from generation to generation in very small, you know, tightly knit groups behind the scenes, you know, underground, grandfather to father, father to son, son to grandson, grandson you know, to great-grandson, etc. Today, 99% of that information is available through Google. And anybody sitting in the middle of a, an Amazon rainforest, you know, with computer, a laptop, an internet connection, almost has the same access to the information which the secret societies have tried to protect or hide from us for thousands of years. So the dilemma for them is, what do we do? because we must have the upper hand. So on the one hand, what you're seeing right now is they're destroying the world's economy on purpose because again, progress and development is directly proportional to population density. 
So if you have technology, you have more. If you don't have technology, if you can destroy technology on purpose, if you can go, go to zero growth, deindustrialization, demand destruction, it's gonna get a point in the development of society where you're not gonna have enough technology to support this rapid population growth and the base of population is gonna collapse. Well, the primary goal is to defend the status of a unipolar world, even if that means to prepare a preemptive global first strike. The oligarchy want to defend their privilege to be a superior species, and they want to keep the rest of the population deliberately backward and stupid, and that is why they promote such banal entertainment, which is only aimed that people stop to think. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The potential for the disastrous rise of misplaced power exists and will persist. We must never let the weight of this combination endanger our liberties or democratic processes. We should take nothing for granted. Only an alert and knowledgeable citizenry can compel the proper meshing of the huge industrial and military machinery of defense with our peaceful methods and goals, so that security and liberty may prosper together. Look at Google, Apple, Microsoft, IBM. These Bilderberg-affiliated megacorporations form an integral part of the United States security apparatus. Behind these technologies, enormous streams of capital are being expended and, more importantly, invested behind the scenes. Now we're at a point where that entire system is at a breaking point where it's hopelessly bankrupt, the debt is impossible to pay, the derivatives, which are purely speculative, unregulated gambling bets on top of the debt bubble itself, is estimated at one and a half quadrillion dollars, which is a multiplier of even the most optimistic idea of global GDP that's completely off the charts. So this entire system is doomed, and we're quite frankly at a point now where it would be no surprise if on any given day you woke up and found out that the entire transatlantic financial system had just evaporated. Well, a lot of people think that the British Empire no longer exists, but this is an illusion. Just ask yourself, why is it that after the big financial crash of 2007, 2008, there was absolutely nothing done by the G20 or anybody else to re-regulate the banking system? And they kept quantitative easing, they kept zero interest rate policy, which is really expropriating the majority of the population. And now we are in front of an even bigger crash than 2008, and there are no so-called tools anymore to do anything about it. So uh, the reason is that the oligarchy controls what is called globalization. And globalization is really only another word another notion for the British Empire. It is the combination of central banks, investment banks, hedge funds, private equity funds, insurance and reinsurance firms who control what is generally called the global financial system. And in reality, the EU is only the continental sub-entity of that empire. Well, the, the, the British Empire knows that in the long run it cannot survive in a world which is based on science and technology and development. And therefore their policy is to stop that kind of technology and development. Uh, that's why they target nation states. 
That's why, for instance, that they are adamant against the BRICS and the emergence of the BRICS, which is nations which have the strength and the power and the commitment and the mission to building nations through science and technology. That has to be stopped in their view. Therefore, their target is the idea of the nation state itself. Destroy nation states in order to preserve and maintain the power of the empire. There is absolutely a plan to depopulate the world, and you simply have to listen to or read the writings of people like Prince Philip of Great Britain, who has stated explicitly that we should reduce the population of the world from seven billion people down to one billion. He has stated very charmingly that he would like to be reincarnated as a virus to try to reduce the world's population. If you kind of play with the numbers, you realize that, you know, I've had almost 7 million people have read my book, maybe another 20, 30 million people are aware of what Bilderberg is. But like, my question is, how many millions of people watch the Oscars? How many millions of people watch the Super Bowl? How many hundreds of millions of people watch, you know, the finale of the Big Brother? So the point is that when you play with the numbers, you realize it's easy to sway people's attentions. And also, because of everything we've been taught and how we've been you know, taught to behave as people, the media, which forms part of this conspiracy, they've been able to convince the people that unless something is on the cover of the New York Times, the Washington Post, Le Monde, uh, The Economist, uh, Wall Street Journal, it doesn't exist. Which is why so many times people say to me, if what you say is true and it is shocking, why is it not on the cover of the New York Times? Because again, the New York Times is of this world. They form part of the Bilderberg organization. They form part of all these other societies. They're part of the elite. Their job is not to tell the truth, but to sell a particular vision of reality which the elitists need to move their agenda forward. We're in a lot of trouble because you people and 62 million other Americans are listening to me right now because less than 3% of you people read books. Because less than 15% of you read newspapers. Because the only truth you know is what you get over this tube. Right now, there is a whole, an entire generation that never knew anything that didn't come out of this tube. This tube is the gospel, the ultimate revelation. This tube can make or break presidents, popes, prime ministers. This tube is the most awesome goddamn force in the whole godless world. No, no existe esa libertad. Además, sería inocentemente estúpido creer que un periodista es libre de escribir lo que, lo que él sabe que es verdad en un periódico, en una radio, en una televisión que no son suyos. El periódico o el medio que sea, ni siquiera es del director. El periódico es de un grupo de empresarios. Y esos empresarios, a su vez, dependen de un entramado político, de un entramado económico, para tener papel, para tener publicidad, para evitar problemas de censura, para tener libertad. No existe esa libertad. Media is often altered to convince the public that something is happening that is not happening. There was a movie once made called Wag the Dog about a president who was involved in a scandal much like Bill Clinton with Monica Lewinsky. And the way they get out of the scandal, the White House concocts a war against Albania. During George W. Bush administration, there was a quote from Karl Rove, who was Bush's major political advisor. Rove said that the White House can create its own reality, and if they don't like the reality they have created, in 30 minutes, they can change it because the White House has total influence over the way the media reports the news.
c'è una congiura del silenzio, non si vuole far sapere all'opinione pubblica chi veramente comanda i poteri forti, le loro riunioni, il Bilderberg, la trilaterale, che si riuniscono a porte chiuse, senza che nessuno possa sentire, nessun estraneo e soprattutto riferire ai popoli cosa si è deciso sul loro futuro. Beh, noi combattiamo questa dittatura dei poteri occulti e riteniamo che il potere debba essere restituito ai nostri popoli. Questa è democrazia e perciò quando qualcuno di noi riesce a far comunicare all'opinione pubblica queste verità si cerca di screditarlo, di chiamarlo cospirazionista. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, this, this is the first occasion for me as I've never previously answered a question in the House of Commons on behalf of a private organisation uh, for which the government has no responsibility. <laughs> the, the Bilderberg organisation exists for the purpose of holding meetings uh, once a year in various countries. It exists for no other purpose. Uh, and uh, this year the meeting was uh, held at a large hotel near Watford in Hertfordshire. Uh, the, the, I didn't receive adequate notice of this question as it happens, because I wasn't found in time, to put to hand the list of those who participated and the agenda which we discussed, but we always circulate those before the meeting and they're readily available and I could certainly put any honourable member in touch with a, a source of the list of those who, who took uh, part. Each year we, we invite uh, something over 100 people, it was about 140 this year, uh, drawn from both sides of the Atlantic, from Europe, uh, including Turkey, uh, and uh, from the United States and Canada. The people who attend are drawn from the worlds of government, politics, academia, defence, journalism, uh, we all attend, in an, the, the, the people who attend change slightly each year, there's a core of those who regularly attend, different people come. Well, I'm, I'm trying to guess at what on earth people are asking a parliamentary question about this for and what they're interested in. Well, some chosen uh, uh, journalists are, uh, are admitted to the Bilderberg uh, conference, but they are not allowed to, to write about it, what they hear and what they say, and it's actually co completely forbidden. And they, they don't swear an oath, but they just promise that they are not allowed to. And that's why, uh, actually, you never see in the papers, even in the big newspapers, uh, good uh, articles about the Bilderberg meetings and what is happening there because uh, journalists who are uh, well allowed to enter they are forbidden to write about it. No, in absoluto, no es normal que periodistas o directores o propietarios de medios asistan a unas reuniones donde se están dilucidando, se están debatiendo asuntos mundiales de importancia de la actualidad o del futuro inmediato y que no informen de ello con el sentido clásico de la información, noticia, es decir, texto, titular, reportaje, entrevista. Pero, hay que decirlo, si informan subliminalmente, indicando, dirigiendo lo que se debe decir desde esos medios, creando la moda opinativa. Ellos, podríamos decir, que asisten como convidados de piedra, pero luego van a, a partir de ahí, a orientar la opinión pública hacia los intereses que se hayan establecido en esos debates. Security was tight today at the Grove Hotel in this leafy area north of London. 140 members of the global elite arrived here for a top secret, hush hush, off the record conference in the English countryside. How's this for a guest list? The head of the International Monetary Fund, former Treasury Secretary Tim Geithner, the heads of Amazon.com, Google, and BP Oil, former General and CIA Director David Petraeus. And what's a top secret cabal of puppet masters without Henry Kissinger? All of them came here today 
for the Bilderberg Conference. That's Bilderberg, not Bilderberg. Participants are tight-lipped about discussions, other than to say topics will range from the economy to jobs to U.S. foreign policy, what the organizers call megatrends and the major issues facing the world. Reporters and outsiders are not allowed in, and everything is off the record. Organizers say that so participants can take time to listen, reflect, and gather insight. I got uh, in early October from someone in the uh, Austrian uh, Ministry of the Interior an official document which uh, was handed out to all the personnel in the Ministry of the Interior as well as Special Forces and the police departments uh, basically canceling holidays for the first uh, two weeks of June as a result of the Bilderberg Conference which is being held right now in a hotel uh, half an hour from here. Un grupo de poder, un grupo de poderosos, de poderosos que no pertenecen a ningún gobierno nacional, pero sí son parte de un gobierno supranacional, un gobierno mundial. Ellos no adoptan decisiones ejecutivas, pero sí prefiguran y predeciden lo que ha de acontecer. O sea, ellos diseñan los futuros, los futuros convenientes en el escenario económico, en el escenario político, en el escenario defensivo. Well, you know, we're in a hotel in uh, in Innsbruck, about uh, 35 kilometers from uh, from uh, the uh, hotel where the Bilderberg conference is actually taking place. Getting uh, the information from uh, from my sources inside the Bilderberg Group on the uh, key points, uh, which are being discussed as uh, as we speak. Daniel, I'm pasting for you some of the key discussion points, which shall be taken up at this year's meeting. As you know, the world is in dire shape and the financial system can blow out at any moment. There are a lot of very worried, or should I say freaked out people who will be attending this year's conference. Their only saving grace is that most of the planet is completely oblivious to what is going on around them. Good luck to you and as always put this information to good use. Instead of uh, going to the hotel, and if you can't get anywhere near the hotel, there's a, a five uh, kilometer you know, a security perimeter. And actually, from what we're hearing, it's actually has gone over to almost eight kilometers. So, uh, um, you know, when you're eight kilometers away, you can't get anywhere near the hotel. And uh, so as I get the information anyway, because my sources are inside the conference, from uh, what we're seeing, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's absolutely impossible to get anywhere near the hotel, and I hope somebody does, but I don't think so. And there's some very, very heavy points. Artificial intelligence, that's the uh, future of humanity, transhumanism, the change from humanity to transhumanity to post-humanity. Cybersecurity, that's one of the key issues which the Bilderbergers have been talking about for a very long time. And that has to do with controlling the internet, obviously chemical weapons, threats, current economic issues, which is, you know, the world is going to hell in a handbasket. This is the, uh, the information which he sent me, and I'm just downloading, you know, all the stuff on the subject of, of America. And uh, in the first two pages of this extract, seven page extract, I'm seeing this like the fifth time, I'm seeing perpetual war, okay, uh, multi-generational threat. Now, uh, would you give me a second just to see what else is there? Now, one of the things about perpetual wars Perpetual wars require perpetual funding. Non-ending war, non-ending funding, which means that you throw as much money as you want 
into a particular situation, which is this, you know, war on terror. How long? We don't know. Forever. How much money? As much as you need. So the idea is, again, you control uh, both sides of the equation. You control the left and the right. You control the, you know, the, the, the dialogues through the media. And then you push the idea of perpetual war. L'état d'urgence sera décrété, ce qui veut dire que certains lieux seront fermés, la circulation pourra être interdite et il y aura également des perquisitions qui pourront être décidées dans toute l'île de France. L'état d'urgence, lui, sera proclamé sur l'ensemble du territoire. La seconde décision que j'ai prise, c'est la fermeture des frontières. Immediately after the terrorist attack against Charlie Hebdo at the beginning of this year, the former U.S. Senator Bob Graham said that if the famous 28 pages of the original September 11 report would have been published, this attack would not have happened. Now, what this means is that the original September 11 Commission of the Congress published a report and 28 pages are classified to the present day, but we more or less know what's in it. It pertains to the role of Saudi Arabia financing terrorism and Wahhabi Salafist attacks around the world. Now, this has another dimension, and that is that the Anglo-Americans have instrumentalized radical Islam since Brzezinski in 1975. Humanity has almost destroyed itself a number of times. Immediately before the Golden Renaissance, there was the New Dark Age. There was the Black Death, where about half of the population of Europe was destroyed not only by a disease, the bubonic plague, but destroyed by the fact that men were convinced that they could not solve the problem. But fortunately, there was a new paradigm then. There was a renaissance. It was the golden renaissance of, uh, of uh, Leonardo da Vinci in Italy, of Miguel de Cervantes in Spain, of Shakespeare in London, which developed the concept of man, a new paradigm in which we organized our business as human beings based on the concept of man's morality, creativity, and free will. We cannot have a situation where, as in Greece, 60% of the youth have no jobs. That is killing the future of society. Or Spain, where it is almost at 60%. That is killing the future if youth don't have a mission and a purpose to fulfill. Almost halfway through the second decade of the 21st century, I ask myself something over and over again making an attempt to understand what is happening to us. Where are we going as nations, as a world? What will happen to us if the Bilderberg Group and their cohorts finally win? What is the destiny of the human race? What does it mean to be immortal? That's a very interesting question because there are two ways of talking about immortality. We all die. No one has, so far has discussed, uh, discovered a, a method by which we can live eternally as in our biological form. 
So therefore, the meaning of the human mind and the human body may not be quite the same thing. For example, people like Einstein, for example, who over a century ago defined matter, antimatter progress, which we're now going into today. So some people are immortal because of the consequences of their having existed. And the best we can do as human beings, which no other animal can do, is we can continue to be immortal in our participation in the development of humanity and the development of our solar system. So immortality means one thing. It means these are the consequences of your having lived, the benefits for mankind of your having lived, one way or the other, as a poet or as a scientist or whatever. You've contributed something to the wealth of humanity. And you are, in that sense, immortal. Or you can be a poor slug who doesn't think, who has no consequence, no reason to exist, who just lives and dies. And that's the choice. I have had uh, um, certain uh, attempts uh, on the part of the Bilderberg Group back uh, about 10 years back, where I was actually offered money to cease and desist, go away. And uh, I describe it in, uh, in, in one of my books. And as I sat there watching this man write a check, I said to myself and I said to him, help me out please. How many zeros is one's freedom worth? Uh, he stopped, paused, looked at me, gave me the check, which I have, you know, check as a memento, and he said, Mr. Estulin, you have a nice day. So the point is that even if they do kill me once, I think I've done my bit on this planet Earth, and I've reached a certain level of immortality, and I've done my part to pass off the baton to the future generations, and it's their job you know, to pick it up and go with it, because again, humanity's one. And we have to do everything in our power to make sure that we, as society, achieve this immortality. And for me, immortality is assuring the survival of the species, all of the species. And for us to happen, for this to happen, we've got to make sure that higher ideals, you know, on the general level of things, take precedence over money. And even once, personal safety. Yes, we can win this war, but the first step necessary for actually winning is to know what the war is. The war is not against merely financial interests or military powers or even groups as powerful as the Bilderberger Group. It is a war against what has been called powers and principalities. It's a war against a concept of man which is evil. It's the concept of man that we are nothing other than animals. It is an idea which says that human beings do not have the capability of a creative spark, that we do not in fact have free will, that we therefore cannot act morally or immorally, we just simply do whatever our desires say. And it is that concept of man which finds expressions today in things like the Bilderberg Group and in the global financial system which is based on speculation, usury, and the destruction of populations. We are at the crossroads, and the roads we take now will determine whether we will live in the 21st century as nation-state republics or subjugated, called, and dehumanized crop of slaves. We are fighting a combined effort of some of the most brilliant people in history who scheme against us for the purposes of possessing us. But the human will is immortal. Tyrants have killed millions, and yet people fought and eventually won their freedom. Freedom stirs the human heart, and fear stills it. Amidst the deafening cacophony of patriotic silence, insurgent voices command attention. Immortality has its moral basis in truth and incorruptibility. It deserves to be given all the support that it can get. It deserves to be fought and died for.
Oh, ba da ba ba ba, it's my song. Oh, ba ba ba, the more I see, the less I know. I look for the different, but at the end, it's all the same. It's all the same. I look for a new light, but at the end you are my only star. I look for a new step, but at the end you are the only way. I look for a new vision. But at the end, you are my eyes. Oh, ba da ba ba ba, I sing. Oh, ba da ba ba ba, it's my song. Oh, ba ba ba, the more I see, the less I know. Walking in the morning light, walking all alone, walking in the evening light, walking with my only son.